Hello coders, welcome to episode 202 of the How to Code Well podcast. Today we're going to be continuing on with our micro series, I suppose you can call it, micro series of how to get into the software development industry. I'm going to be pulling some bits and pieces out of the book that I'm currently writing, my untitled book yet about getting into the software dev industry. And in particular today we're going to be focusing on how to be presentable and how to present yourself in an interview style situation. And also I have some questions that you could ask when, you know, the period in the interview where they say, do you have any questions? You could ask these questions if you want. So I've got a couple of those that we'll go through. Okay. So before we dive into that, just want to apologize about the last episode. For some reason, there was some blue lights that were going on in the video. If you're listening to this on audio, then that obviously doesn't matter. And also <laughs> the doggies were barking, weren't they last time? Hopefully that won't happen this time. But if so, you'll, you'll probably notice it because I'll do a jump cut where I pause the, pause the video, have to sort the dogs out, come back, and I'm probably stood in a very different position. But anyway, let's talk about the dress code, hey? Let's start off by talking about this weird subject, the dress code, and then we'll get into the other areas of being presentable when you are a software developer. So let's set the scene, right? So you've just sat down at the interview. How should you look? How should you look? You've got probably, what, two, three people in front of you, right? And they're going to be judging you on your answers and how you articulate yourself and how you present yourself, right? So how should you look? Because the whole saying of don't judge a book by a cover, that doesn't really work here, okay? That doesn't really work here. Now, let's talk about how I have had interviews over the past. Let's give you some context. So the very first interview that I ever had, I was wearing a suit, a full suit with, you know, smart, polished shoes, a tie. I was the works, right? <laughs> I looked like the typical child who was wearing your dad's suit. I'm sure it was too big for me. And it was terrifying. It was utterly, utterly terrifying. It was the most uncomfortable thing I wasn't feeling very great and I mean that interview went well which I'm really happy with but the next interview after that a couple of years after that um, I was still wearing the suits and I was actually presenting a, a PowerPoint presentation I believe it was a PowerPoint it was a presentation to the people who were the the hiring managers and the people in the, in the room they wanted me to present a, a software methodology this was, we're talking now, we're talking like, oh gosh, 10, 20 years ago. This, so this is a long, long time, all right? Now, when I have interviews, now, you know, these days the interviews are done through Zoom meetings or Google Hangouts or Teams meetings or what have you, right? It's less, less formal. So I won't wear a suit. I'm not going to go in there with a suit and tie or a blazer or anything like that. When I'm working in my day-to-day, -day, I will just wear like this black t-shirt. Obviously, I have other black t-shirts, but I wear kind of like, um, I kind of call it like a uniform. It's just what I wear. It's black t-shirt and jeans, right? And, and a, a jumper. Occasionally, I'll wear a hoodie. If I'm speaking to customers, customer-facing people, then perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll wear something a little bit more smarter, but I won't go full suit. I won't go full suit. The reason why I don't go full suit is because I feel like I'm presenting myself in a very false way. I'm not genuine because that's not what I wear. I don't wake up in a suit and I don't go to sleep in a suit. That That is not who I am. I feel very uncomfortable being that smart. And it is, it's also super uncomfortable if you are sat with other people who are trying to work out whether you're a good fit for the team if they are not wearing smart clothes either. So you go in there, the smartest person in the room, perhaps the smartest person in the whole company at that one particular time. You you know, you can tell people who are going for interviews by the way they walk, dress, and the anxiety levels that they just radiate. When I go into for an interview now, especially face-to-face -face interviews, and in fact, when I go to see a client in face-to-face -face, face -face situations, say I'm going to their office, then I will wear very smart trousers and I'll be wearing uh, smart shoes and I'll be wearing a 
a shirt, an iron shirt, but I won't be wearing a tie and I won't be wearing like a smart blazer or anything like that, like a suit blazer. I, I might be wearing like a, a coat that looks relatively smart casual, but that's that's as far as I'll go. That's as far as I'm happy to go. Now, olden times, everybody had suits and were wearing suits to go on interviews, regardless of what the interview was, right? Because, you know, that's just that was just the thing. But these days, that isn't the thing, especially now with the whole remote working, right? I'm talking to you now. I'm not going to prove it to you because that's disgusting, but I'm talking to you now, not wearing any socks, <laughs> right? <laughs> so just put that into context. So sometimes I'll just wear slippers like during the day, you know, it's comfortable, it's comfortable. But when I'm in it, when I'm with a client, when I'm with the client's customers, then yeah, I will obviously be looking more presentable. And I, but I don't think you need to push that on to the interview. Anyway, we've, we've discussed dress codes <laughs> quite a bit. So let's move on to the noise. So this is moving into like the remote working kind of situation. When you have a, um, an interview, you want to make sure that the background noise is at a minimum, as in zero. Because, and yes, I know that, you know, life gets in the way, but if you're trying to listen and also answer, and you've only got a short period of time, like maybe 40 minutes of this interview, maybe an hour, right? But you can't have distractions. You can't have people coming into the office. You can't have uh, your your phone needs to be on silent and your phone needs to be on do not disturb, right? You cannot have notifications moving your alertness away from the actual interview that you're con you're having here. So you want to keep your no the noise to a l real minimum. In fact, when I'm on a call, I will wear noise cancelling headphones. So if there is any noise in the background, I am not distracted by it. So that is super important super we hear all the time of people being disturbed during their day-to-day -day working environment this is why i've got the door shut i don't know how people do it when they've got children i mean i hats off to you when you're you've got that sort of level of distraction i get very frustrated even when the dogs start barking right and i've got zero control over that the next one is how you should articulate yourself verbally this is something that you may have noticed with me i don't swear a lot i do swear but I don't swear a lot. And I certainly don't swear amongst people who I am having an interview with, right? Or I don't swear around the customers that the client has, right? Because that to, that feels very icky. Now, this is a personal preference, but I really recommend that you don't swear, especially in the interview. And if someone in the in the conversation swears, that to me does not give me the right to swear, right? It, yeah, okay, that they might feel comfortable in doing that, but I don't feel comfortable, uh, you know, replicating that. Again, I don't try and put myself above anybody else, but it's just I just don't I don't like it. I don't think it's professional uh, swearing. So, and then this goes into the next one about being respectful. So when someone's talking. You listen and you look into their eyes and you listen and you understand exactly what they're saying or you try and understand. And if you don't understand, you ask them to maybe talk about it in a different way, you know, ask the question in a, in a different way under a different context, that kind of stuff. And when you're, you're talking, you want to make sure that you answer the question that was asked. This is something that I, I fall foul of sometimes. When someone asks me a question, I will answer it, but I'll answer it in the manner of a different question. So perhaps they've asked me a question and I don't particularly know the full answer. So I will answer it around. It's kind of like a politician's answer, um, which I'm trying to get better at. And often at the end of the conversation, I'll say something like, sorry for that long winded answer or something like that, you know, but that wasn't the thing that you actually asked me. This is, this is the answer, that kind of stuff. Yes, it's your time to talk, but you want to be talking about the, you want to be giving the answer that was asked around the whole respectfulness. And you want to be aware of the person's name, the people who are interviewing you, you want to know who they are and you want to address them by their names as well. It makes you feel as a person, it makes you feel valued. If someone says your name 
or says, you know, welcome, blah, 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 hello, blah, 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 that kind of stuff, right? It, it just, you're, you're not seen as just a resource. You know, you are, you acknowledge who they are as human beings. And also know the roles that they have, right? So do some, um, do some snooping on LinkedIn and find out what it is that they actually do within the company. And then you might be able to tailor your questions that we'll get into in a minute around, you know, what, what they are, what, what role they actually do and target the people who perhaps have the answers. Because in the interview, you may be faced with someone who is technical, like on the team that you'll, you'll be working on. You might be faced with someone who is less technical, maybe a hiring manager, or you might be faced with a, a, a PM. Or, or what have you, right? So you, your audience will vary in their roles, but you want to know who they are and you want to know what roles they do, okay? The last thing I would say, and I know that I'm... So all of these things are in the book, but <laughs> I haven't read... The, I haven't read... I haven't written this chapter yet. So these are like the headlines. So the, as I go about writing my book, I've got these like... I don't know, bullet points that I will expand on. So all of these points I'm going to be expanding on, and I'll certainly be giving some of my examples of my my uh, previous history and um, my experience of interviews, especially wearing suits and whatnot. But one thing I definitely remember, my first ever interview, no, no, no not my first ever, one of my earlier interviews, it wasn't my first one, one of my earlier interviews, I... M- made sure that I got there early. In fact, I drove up there beforehand to work out where it was that I needed to go. That is so important, right? Because if I'm, I'm not the best, um, navigator, let's say, and I prefer to find out the routes before I go rather than just get on, um, a sat nav and, and, and let me, work that out, right? I would rather have an, an idea of where it is I'm going before I get there. So things like where to park, right? Things like how long is it going to take from walking from the car to the actual office block, you know, knowing all of those kind of things. Google Maps is great because you can, you can like walk through it you in like a live kind of way, live view can sort of like keep pressing forward and it's, it's almost like you're walking the route. So you can have a little snoop around if the Google map car, whatever it's called, has has taken video footage of, or, or photo footage of the office block and you can see the car park, you know where, to, where, where it is, that kind of stuff. But one of the earlier interviews I, I had, I actually got dinged on the car, right? So as I was getting, I was all flustered. I was wearing my suit. I was in a very hot car and um, I was running a little bit late or... I wasn't running late for the interview, but I was running later than I had liked because I had padded out enough time to have these kind of problems. But unfortunately, a taxi drove past me and clipped. It was on like a dual carriageway and clipped one, my um, my wing mirror. And I, th- I believe it w- even broke, right? It was it was just he we were in traffic and I. Um, he was, he pulled out. And as he pulled out, he just, he was just too close. It was just too close. And I mean, that stressed me out, right? (laughs) That really stressed me out. I thought that was like a bad omen for the rest of the day. But I managed to get to the car park and park. And I managed to have, I think it was 15 minutes before I needed to be sat at the reception. So I, I, what I did is I planned out, like I wanted to be in the reception for 15 minutes before the actual interview, which made meant I want to be in the car 15 minutes before that actually happens. So that's a half an hour window, right? So I had, I had arrived within that half an hour window with plenty of time to spare. I got to the, to the interview and I think I was about 10, 15 minutes from the interview, which was great. Which So that was all good. But the time that when I parked up, I was just kind of doing some breathing exercises. I mean, I was just dinged by a car and I was covered in sweat because I was getting stressed out and I was about to go in for this interview and it wasn't fun. That, that 15 minutes was not fun. It was just like, I was a nervous wreck as you can kind of imagine. But the point of this story is that you want to pad the time in because you have no idea what's going to happen. You could get stuck in traffic. There could be an accident on the road. You know, all of these kind of things. There could be a diversion that you're, you're not 
uh, sure about, right? So it could take you a completely different route. And if you're someone like me who just gets stressed over these stupid little things, you know, one thing adds up to the next and yeah, and then it just ruins the whole experience. What you want to do is pad in some time to not only handle the situations that may you may come across, but also how you react to those and calm down. So pad in enough time, get there super, super early. Okay, we're going to go for a break and then we're going to talk about questions that you could ask in the actual interview. If you're looking to level up your programming skills or wanting to learn a new programming language, then I highly recommend checking out the affiliate link in the show notes below for Manning. So with Manning, you can learn programming skills using their online video course platform, or you can buy some of their books. They're both eBooks as well as physical books on all sorts of programming disciplines, such as Python, artificial intelligence, machine learning, testing, SQL, all sorts of various different things. Their best sellers at the minute are around artificial intelligence, AI powered developer. There is AI assisted data science. There is also learn AI assisted Python programming. And if I was to go to the all products section here, we can see that they have a huge amount of titles that you can choose from, including JavaScript, C Sharp, Go, Spark, Kubernetes, and the reason why I like Manning myself is because I'm actually a Manning author. I've created this Docker in Motion course. It is 135 exercises, five hours and 19 minutes, all teaching you Docker. Now, as a Manning author, I have experienced firsthand how thorough they are when it comes to creating content and resources. So my Docker in Motion course here, it was actually sent out to a lot of Docker devs who were able to advise and help me tweak this course. And they do that with all of their resources. So I really do recommend Manning. And of course, they have a lot of deals on at the minute because we're coming up to Christmas. So this week, buy two or more and save 45%. So do check out Manning. Use the affiliate link in the show notes below. You'll not only help support this channel, but you'll also level up your programming skills. So here are some questions that you could ask in the actual interview. You know the period in the interview where they say, do you have any questions? Rather than being completely blank over that, you want to be asking questions. That is your opportunity to ask questions and find out more about what it is that you're actually going to be doing. Some of the questions that you could ask could be these. Number one, what is the release process? So you're building software, right? You're building code. You're writing code. Is there a process to to release this into the wild? Is this the system that you're currently working on, is that already in production and therefore do they already have a release process or is there going to be the first deployment and that goes to production and you're going to be involved in that also this question could also bring in things like what is the qa what is the testing what is the way in which we get from you know ticket creation over to deployment what is the process you want to be looking out for things like agile methodologies that they might say or waterfall, God no, that they might mention. And you will want to see how how that relates to your experience. OK, your previous experience. If you've been in this industry for a while, this is a great question to kind of flesh out how this project is going to be released compared to the projects that you've had before, because there's there's. 101 ways of doing this, right? Releasing code. Is it automated? Is it a manual s step? Are there any Docker containers involved or, a, a, you know, containerization involved? What are the testing procedures? Are there nightly builds? That kind of stuff. So this question is, it, it can be quite technical. So you won't want to direct this to someone who is quite technical, but also... This question also includes things like, as I mentioned, the QA stuff. So this might be a question directed to, say, the 
the uh, project manager. Maybe there is, uh, maybe you could spin this in more of a managerial kind of question about the process of how tickets are created, how tickets are then refined, how tickets are then developed, pushed over to a QA environment and tested, and then off to off to deployment. And then maybe that is when the technical person could chime in about the deployment steps and how that's actually how that rotates are we on blue green deployments are there you know what is it what happens because every every project that i've been on has been so crazily different so this is a i think this is a good question to ask okay the next one number two is do you do you use a ticketing system okay do you use a ticketing system so for example uh, a ticketing system that i've used before is jira but there are many others there could be trello bugzilla that kind of stuff but this also indicates how the tickets are actually created again moving into more of the an agile kind of method it, do you use story points do you use t-shirt sizes how do you deal with investigations are they the spikes how many um sprints do you normally cover you know and how does that look do you do retrospectives what is the process again about moving a ticket from one from from inception to deployment again could be a question for a techie could be a question for a non-techie you've got to read the room right you've got to read the room also, don't ask these questions if these questions have already been answered, <laughs> right? Because that shows that you haven't been listening. So you want to be asking these questions only if there's massive knowledge gaps. But if they have suggested an answer already based on what they've said during the interview, then maybe you can alter the question slightly by saying something like, you've mentioned that you use jira for your ticketing system how do you go about measuring the size of the tickets what do you do about investigations and spikes uh, and that kind of stuff and how do you measure the um the the frequency of dev tickets to devs what's the burn down chart like all of that kind of stuff so you, so you can kind of you can kind of mold it around the context that you've already been given all right so the next question is the testing process so what does that look like obviously from a developer's point of view a developer should test their own work but is there a secondary qa team or i shouldn't say a secondary their primary should is there a qa team or a QA member of staff who can test work based on given acceptance criteria. Maybe regression testing. Is there any of that involved? What happens to who has the final say on whether something is is finished or, or not? A, a very important question, I think. Again, this these are general questions that you could ask regardless of what kind of project it is, I think, the size of the project. And I've purposely kept these nice in general as well for, for that for that for that very reason, because in my opinion, every project needs to be tested by a human being. But there also needs to be testing done automatically. And this is where you can sort of bring in what, what kind of unit tests are there? Is there any integration tests? Is there any database tests? Is there any, um, you know, acceptance tests? that kind of stuff, functional tests and whatnot. And often they'll either say, yes, there is, and we're really hot on that, and we're hot on like testing, um, test-driven development. That's fantastic. That's great. Or they'll say something like, there isn't any tests at the minute, but we would like to bring some tests in. And if that's the case, you could then follow that up by, well, what what do you think that will look like? You know, could you explain how that that might look or they might say there's a bunch of tests and some of them just don't work and so we just you know some of them are commented out or just not in use and then with that you can say well is there any kind of work and is there a plan to tidy that up going forward and is that something that i could i could get my teeth into that kind of stuff um okay the next question is about versioning all right so you could say if it's a php role you could say well what version of php are you on what version of a framework are you running is there any plans on upgrading uh th these kind of things 
same with Python or JavaScript or whatever, any kind of thing that has a version pinned to it, you can say, well, what are the versions that you're running against? And then hopefully that will open them up to say what they plan to do and how to upgrade those things going forward. And again, you can then ask, well, is that something that I'm going to be involved in? And if you've got any experience of upgrading, then that's a time, and you haven't mentioned that yet, that could be a, a, a good opportunity for you to do so. And if you could ta- if you could mention like an experience that you've had when upgrading something, maybe something that you, you, you didn't realize and you discovered and you fixed, that kind of stuff, uh, then that's a really good idea. And the last question is around continual integration. So what kind of tools do you use to make sure that the code that that I am writing integrates well with the rest of the code or the code that other developers are writing integrates well with the rest of the code? So for example, if you're a PHP dev, are there PHP unit tests? Are there code style checks? And what are the standards that you're currently running against? Is there any static analysis checks? If it's a JavaScript application, again, is there any linting checks? Do you use TypeScript and how how are those checked? What is the automation around this? Are you using, say, GitHub Actions? Are you using um, GitLab Runners? At what point in the process do these get checked? You know, obviously, hopefully, (laughs) hopefully it'll be when code is being integrated in but are there some other checks involved when we're packaging up this thing for production so those are the questions i know these are very sort of like high level questions and um, but i decide i've decided to keep it like that because it's very it allows these questions to be asked regardless of what the project is obviously if you've got questions that relate specifically to the project and maybe some of these these questions aren't, aren't won't be necessary. Then do ask those questions and ask those questions first if you can. And if you've got no time, if there is literally no time, I've had interviews before where we've talked so much that the the whole "Have you got any questions left?" wasn't a thing because we ran out of time. If you've still got these questions then submit them to an email. What you could say is, can I have someone's email address? Because I probably, I may have some questions after after this. And that, again, that's very important because that's showing that you've, you're keen and willing to do, to do this. Okay, we're going to go for a quick break and then I'm going to be talking about what's coming up in How to Code Well Land. This show is brought to you by Cloudways. Cloudways is a multi-cloud hosting platform that allows you to choose between the top three cloud platform providers, such as DigitalOcean, AWS, and Google Cloud for your next application. Not only that, but Cloudways offers 24-7 support, a load of applications that you can one-click install, Different environments, staging environments, and staging and testing is a really important thing that we talk about on this show. The importance of having QA environments, staging environments, not just production environments. It also comes with free SSL certificates, a dedicated firewall, Cloudflare Enterprise CDN, automated backups. The list of things that Cloudways provides is endless. Also, they have a really good learning resources section that you can learn how to use these services on the Cloudways site. Now, do use the Cloudways link that I've got in the show notes below, because right now they have a 40% off four months and 40 free migrations. So do check out that. Use the link in the show notes below. You're also going to support the show by doing so at no additional cost to yourself. So right now, at the time of recording, they have a 40% off for four months and 40 free migrations. So do check out Cloudways to host your next application. So something I would like to start doing are these knowledge bites. These knowledge bites are small little 10, 15 minute snippets of, of me talking about a specific thing in software development. The, the first one we, we've done is around refactoring code and the key to refactoring code. 
And what I've been doing is I've been creating these knowledge bites when I'm out and about doing things, walking the dog or um, the last one we did was when I was walking back from the gym. So I'll be having my headphones on and I'll be just talking into my phone. OK, so if you want to get those knowledge bites, then please do check out patreon.com forward slash how to code well, because they are available to only Patreons. And the, the, if you want to support the show, please head over there. Or you could go to buymeacoffee.com as well, forward slash how to cope well. Patreons also get the episode a week early, which is awesome. So I've, I've changed the schedule a little bit. So I'm recording this knowing that this is not going to go out f- for a whole week. So if you want to get this before anyone else does, uh, then you please please join uh, patreon.com, give give some support, that would be fantastic. Or there's buy me a coffee. There's also some code there as well if you want to, um, there's some code from, from a couple of projects that I've created as well. Uh, so if you want to learn to code, uh, there was the JavaScript, um, JavaScript tip calculator code from there too. And in the future, I'm going to be providing more and more content to Patreon and buy me a coffee down the line as well. A massive thank you to our Patreons. We have, I'm going to butcher these names. We've got David Sprong. We have Majane Zamalrak. And we have Alo Mon, Al, Al Ron Mick Unrelated. Oh, very difficult names to pronounce. I will be mentioning these names and the other Patreon, hopefully... If, if you want to sign up, be a Patreon, you get your name read out here too. I do appreciate it. Thank you ever so much. Happy coding, everyone. Have a lovely, fantastic rest of your week. Stay warm. It is so cold outside. Happy coding. Take care. Bye-bye.